I worship you because righteous is who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God who is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. His name is worthy to be praised. Are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Praise God. I am thankful today to be here and to be a part of this worship experience. Praise God. Because our God is worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. This morning, uh, I, I want to move right into our text for the morning. Amen. I want to talk to you from the subject, the great debate. Amen. The great debate coming out of the council in Jerusalem. It's found in Acts, the 15th chapter, starting at verse... Six. Acts, the 15th chapter, starting at verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips, the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to our God. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. We're living in some changing times. Right. Almost hourly, things are changing. Right. And yet, I must say to you that in a changing world, we serve a changeless God. Right. Amen. God is not changing his position he is not changing his word. He is not changing his plan to accommodate yours. All right. All right. God's way is the best way. Amen. And if we're going to be the people of God, if we're going to be uh, the people that God has called for in these last days, we're going to have to align ourselves not with the culture, but with God. In the book of Acts, of course, we have been talking about the fact that the Holy Spirit came in his fullness, uh, in his dominance in the book of Acts. Now, that is not to say that the Holy Spirit has not been active all the time, because indeed he has. Amen. But God the Father was the primary mover and shaker in the Old Testament. Amen. When we get to the Gospels, God the Son is the primary mover and shaker. But when we get to the book of Acts, remember now that Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But if I go, I will send another comforter who will not just be with you like I've been, but he's going to be in you. Yes. Hallelujah. And so we see a new chapter in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit 
is taking the dominant role. Amen. Praise God. All right. We also see the birth of the church in the book of Acts. Yeah. For when the day of Pentecost had fully come, it was Peter who got up and preached. The Bible said 3,000 souls were added to this new institution called the church. Hallelujah. Now, when the church started, it started to grow in such a way that um, problems, or I will call them challenges, arose. Yes, sir. Amen? Uh -huh. Now, God had told us through his son, some of the last words that Jesus spoke. He said, I want you to be witnesses of me and throughout the world. Go ye therefore and teach them what to have taught you. He said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yes. When we get to the book of Acts, the key verse in Acts is Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power. Oh, that's what we need today. We need some power. Amen. Amen. Ye shall receive power when? After that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. How many of you all know we don't serve a sectarian God? We serve a universal God, a God that is not just concerned about your people. But God is concerned about all people. Amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Paul and Barnabas had been separated by the Holy Spirit to go out and proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Praise God. The Jews were told to go and spread the gospel, but as people are, we, are, we like to be in one place at one time. We're not afraid of, of, of the change that we know. We're afraid many times of the change we don't know. And many times the change we don't know is better than with the change we know. So, and so people are reluctant to move at God's command because when you move at God's command, it's going to take you places that you have not gone before. Amen. It's going to have you talking to people who don't look like you. Right. It's going to have you rubbing shoulders with people who you would not ordinarily talk to. And so the people decided they were going to be a great people just in Jerusalem. You know what God will do? When you don't do what he says, God will allow persecution to come. And persecution came on the church. And when persecution arose, they started to scatter. But in the scattering, the word was taken to all parts of the known world. Right. How many of you all know that sometimes God uses trouble in order to move his folk? Right. And so Paul and Barnabas had gone preaching the gospel and many Gentiles were being saved. Amen? Amen. One of the problems that we see in the book of Acts is that everybody wasn't happy that Gentiles were being saved. Oh my goodness. And so you had people who were going behind Paul and Barnabas and teaching a different gospel. They were teaching that not only did you have to have faith in Jesus, but you also had to be circumcised. 
Okay? Now, circumcision was an Old Testament sign to the Jews. Circumcision was the cutting away of the foreskin of the male penis. Amen. And somebody said, well, why would God use that sign? Because every day that, that man had to use that little fellow. And when he used him, it reminded him of his covenant relationship with God. And as the head of the house, it was the man, the priest of the house, responsibility to share it with everybody else in the house. One of the problems in America is that there has been the erosion of the family. And so the man is absent and the house has gone crazy. Because when you don't have the word of God, when you don't adhere to the word of God, there's going to be consequences and repercussions. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so... The man has been displaced. But that doesn't change the word. Amen. Amen. And so they were going around preaching and people were getting saved. But then you had Judaizers who were going after them, who were telling the folk after they had received the gospel that you're really not saved unless you get circumcised. Now, there is a problem in our contemporary world today that harkens back to what I'm talking about right now. Because the reason why major denominations are disintegrating, the reason why people are splitting denominationally is because denominations cannot make up their mind what they're going to believe. So when you have denominations who are debating cultural issues and trying to assign them to God's word, then you have people who are adding to scripture. And there's nowhere in the Bible where circumcision is a prerequisite for salvation. As a matter of fact, if you want to get spiritual, God is not so much concerned about that little fellow in front of you as he is that man inside of you. Amen. There needs to be the cutting away of the old man. Amen. So that the new man can appear. You say, well, where does the new man come from? The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. The world needs to see new today. Amen. We've seen old, and we've seen artificial, and we've even seen folk who are trying to add to Scripture and trying to make Scripture accommodate their lifestyle. That's the reason why denominations are decreasing globally. Praise God. And so they were going around saying, you got to be circumcised. Then there were people who were saying, you got to keep the law. Okay? Got to keep the law. Here's the problem with that. Nobody has kept the law. Amen. Amen. You look in the mirror, what you see is a lawbreaker. All right. Now, if you're a lawbreaker, there's no way you can all of a sudden become a law keeper. Amen. Amen. If you rob the bank, you're a bank robber. You can't unrob the bank. Amen. If you are a lawbreaker, you yourself can't automatically become a law keeper. That's the reason why when you see the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were not given so that you could keep them. The Ten Commandments were given because to remind you that you can't keep them. You see, the Ten Commandments show humanity how
how high God is and how wretched man is. God Almighty. And so so for somebody to say that you can't be saved unless you keep the commandments, that means ain't nobody saved. Amen. Because none of us have kept the law. Amen. And you say, well, I kept some of them. Well, that ain't good enough. Because if you kept some of them and broke any part of them, you're guilty of the whole law. Because the Ten Commandments are not ten separate laws. They are Ten components of one law. That means if you abuse it in any place, you are a lawbreaker. Are y'all with me? But you got people today who are trying to keep the law. And they're so rigid in their religiosity that they want you to keep it too. So you got people in Acts going around saying that uh, you got to be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you're not saved. You got to keep the law. If you don't keep the law, you're not saved. And what they were doing was they were putting a yoke on the necks of Gentiles, making it virtually impossible for them to be saved. I wonder how many yokes people are placing on people's necks today. I wonder what churches are adding to scripture and trying to let people know that you're not saved unless you do this or that. And what I found is that when people don't read the word, they lean to their own understanding. I believe there's a verse in Proverbs that says, lean not to your own understanding, for, but in all your ways acknowledge God and he will direct your path. He'll make your paths straight. But because we got so many leaners today, we got a culture that's leaning and out of step with God. Why? Because God does not change. Amen. Even though you change, God don't change. All right. And I have never, I have never had God to wake me up on any day and lean down from the portals of heaven and say, Gary, I'm in a quanzy. Do you know what I should do today? And you haven't either. And nobody else has either. You know why? Because God doesn't need your opinion. Amen. Amen. And God doesn't run churches by opinion. Yes, sir. Yes. And God doesn't run churches by what you think. Amen. Because when you read Isaiah 61, it says that God's ways are higher than our ways. That's right. That's right. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In other words, if we want to be on God's team, if we want to think like God, if we want to act like God, then we got to embrace God's word and God's position and God's plan and God's purpose. Yes. Yes. And stop leaning to what people say. Amen. Amen. I met a, a lady once who had been out of churches for 23 years because of something somebody added to salvation and because she hadn't met it she thought that she was not saved amen and let me just stick a pin right there and say to because i heard tavin saying as he was standing up here he said that when he felt like that he was inadequate that he did not go forward with the message or the text or whatever that that he was assigned to for that month. Never allow your inadequacies to inhibit you from doing what God wants you to do. Because if we wait until we are ready, we will never be ready. Amen. Amen. If, if you wait until you think you got it all under control, 
That's when you get into trouble. I'll never forget. I'll never forget, Stephanie. I was, I was at a church and I was preaching a text that I knew I thought backwards and forwards. The sermon was polished. I knew it was going to go forward uh, dynamically because I presumed that I was a dynamic speaker. And so I went forward in the text and I had no notes. I didn't have any. I didn't need them because I was polished. I, and right in the middle of the sermon, my thoughts left me. And I was left to myself. Now, 30 seconds left to yourself. When you're up in front of somebody, speaking is a long time. Amen. As a matter of fact, if you get a call on your phone and somebody wait 30 seconds before they speak, y'all be done hung up. Why? Because you feel like if they called you, they got something to tell you. If they ain't saying nothing, then it must not be important. Amen? And that cured me of getting in front of people and thinking that I had it all like I needed to have it. God taught me that day that I don't care how long you've been in this, I don't care how polished you are, how much you know, you can't do it without me. And, and when we are at our weakest, many times that's when God is at his strongest. Amen. Amen. I wish I had time to really break this down and talk to you all because here's the deal. I hear people praying and they pray this prayer and they, I believe they pray the prayer in sincerity. Amen. They pray, God, strengthen me. God, make me strong, strengthen me. And I want to tell them so bad that God don't want to strengthen you. You've been fighting God with the strength you already got. Why would he want to make you stronger so you could fight him more? As a matter of fact, I believe it was John the Baptist that said, I must decrease that he might increase. But I need to tell you that John represented the Old Testament. Now, God don't want you just to decrease, but he wants you dead. You say, well, you know, preacher, you know, you, I was with you there for a minute. <laughs> you done stepped, you done crossed over the line. Well, let's stay with me. Because Jesus fed 5,000 people one day. And, um, you know how people are. You feed people, they'll be waiting for the next feeding. And especially if it's good. I mean, if you lay it out, you got, you know, barbecue ribs and collard greens, lima beans, mac and cheese, you got all the fixings. Black walnut ice cream. I mean, folk will, they will love you. They will come and they will eat. And, they, and the next time they hear that you're going to fix, they will be there. Amen? And folk don't show up to folk house that can't cook. But if they know you can burn, they're going to be there. Now, Jesus fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. And after he fed them, the folk felt so good about Jesus that the Bible says many of them followed Jesus. You know what Jesus did? Because you think that Jesus liked numbers, right? But people think that if you got numbers that Somehow that means that the Lord is favoring you, the Lord bless. No, that doesn't mean that. 
There are a lot of churches that are full that if you really found out who actually followed Jesus, it would be a small percentage. Jesus saw the masses following him. He said, hold on, wait a minute. If you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, they didn't wear crosses in that day like we wear crosses. Everybody got to go. Even the biggest devil in the world might have a cross on. Gold and silver. They, they like to wear them around their neck and the trinkets and stuff. But when they had a cross during Jesus' day, it meant that somebody was going to die that somebody was going to be crucified on. And so Paul, who understood what Jesus was saying in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, how? As a living sacrifice. Now wait a minute. Living and sacrifice don't go together. But you see, when you talk about people today, we have lives, but you're really dead if you don't know Jesus. But then if you do know Jesus, you need to reckon yourself as dead. Because the Lord don't need no more fights. He's fighting enough on the outside. He's fighting enough from devils. He don't need his own folk fighting him. And what's happening in a lot of places, churches, denominations, and that people are adding to scripture and fighting against what God has said and turning off the whole world who are now looking for answers in all the wrong places. This church should be packed today. Churches should be full. Amen. But people are finding alternative things to do because many times the churches don't even know what they believe. And so they had to have a great debate. And so Paul and Barnabas came back to Jerusalem. Peter, all of the big shots came back to Jerusalem to debate what God really intends for people who want to be saved. Oh my goodness. And here's the thing that you got to hold on to. Because people will tell you a whole bunch of stuff today. Stay in your word. Repeat this after me. Stay in your word. Stay in your word. And look at what God has done in the past. Stay in the word. And look at what God has done in the past. And so Judaizers was telling the Gentiles, y'all, y'all, y'all ain't saved. Yeah, I know y'all got excited and everything, but you're really not saved. Has, have you ever gone to a church and somebody got up and told you you wasn't saved because you didn't do what they do? Oh, I have. I have. I, I, I've been in a church where somebody told me that all Baptist folk were going to hell. You know what I did? I got my hat and I walked out. Because some things you just know are not gospel. And if it's not gospel, I don't need to listen to it. Amen? Because some folk are just like windbags. It's just like a dull night, they ain't cutting, they just talking loud and thank you, thank you. Now, if I read my Bible and I'm trying to come to a close because I know you all got other things that you got to, you know, got to get over to the Hall of Fame and I brought the, the black, you know, game here and everything. Everybody got things to do and, and everything, you know. But let me tell you something. The word takes precedence over everything. Yeah, I'm black and I'm black and I'm proud. 
But I love God more than I love blackness. Oh, have mercy, Lord. <laughs> if I read my Bible correctly, Tomir, I believe the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made known unto salvation. Now, I don't read any other prerequisite in the scriptures where if you don't do it, you are not saved. I'm about to go in the water. We're going to be about to have a baptism or two here at the church. And guess what? I believe that if you're saved, you ought to be baptized. But I don't believe that baptism is going to keep you from being saved. You say, well, preacher, how can you, how can you hold that opinion? Now, let me see. What has God done in the past? Jesus, his son, was hanging on a Roman cross. And a thief. It wasn't that they were questioning whether he was a thief. He was a thief. Was hanging with Jesus. And Jesus heard him. Say, if you be the son of God, this is the other thief, let me get this right. The, the other thief say, if you be the son of God, come down and save yourself and we will believe. But then another thief said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Yes, sir. And this thief did not have time to join the first Baptist church in Jerusalem. He didn't have time to go get baptized. He didn't have time to speak in another tongue. He didn't have time to do all of these various things that folks say you got to do in order to be saved. But the Lord said, when this day, this day, you will be with me in paradise. Now, now that's what God has done. I've seen that. Now, if this man could be saved without being baptized, if he could be saved without doing, jumping through all these loops and everybody say he got to jump through, I would rather believe God than believe man. I believe that we serve a God who has no respecter of person. I believe we serve a God who believed that everybody was made in the image and likeness of God. And that nobody is better than anybody else. We're all hell bound unless we receive salvation. Amen. And that salvation comes through one person. And that's the person of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, I know that makes some folk mad. And you know, you know, folk like. Folk are followers. Folk will do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. Come to church every Sunday. Hear the word, saying, go home, benediction, go home, and go back to the same routine. And wonder why they don't have no power, wonder why God is not moving in their lives, wonder why they're still in the same place after 25 years of being in somebody's church, you ain't progressed, you the same thing. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever plugged your vacuum cleaner up or your iron and didn't nothing happen? It didn't run. 
and you thought you it was broke. You thought you needed a new <coughs> vacuum cleaner or you needed a new iron or you needed something new. And you were trying to contemplate how in the world am I going to get a new vacuum cleaner? I don't have enough money, you know, I'm a, a tight budget and everything. And something told you just to push it in a little further. And when you did, lo and behold, vacuum cleaner came on, iron came on. What happened? You looked like you was connected, but you wasn't. <laughs> And so you got to make sure, and this morning is a good morning to make sure that you are connected to the source. Because when you are connected to the source, you march to the beat of a different drummer. And it doesn't matter what your homies and posse and everybody else is doing. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And God intends for you to hang out with him. Amen. It doesn't matter who won't. Amen. I close with this. We used to sing this song in the church. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turn. If no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turn. We don't sing that song no more. Because folk scared to walk alone. But I believe somebody needs to dare to be different. And even though there are great debates going on all over, you don't have to argue with people. Just find out what the word says and then remember what God has done in the past. Amen? Amen. And if you do that, God will show you what he has for you. God will direct you into what you need to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, they made a decision when they had the great debate in Jerusalem. Amen. They told them, well, you know, if you eat, uh, you know, stuff that ain't strangled, you know what I mean, that don't have no blood in it. And, and you know, if you, you know, don't live, you know, crazy, <laughs> you can be saved. I guess that was all right. But guess what? I'm going to follow Jesus. Wherever Jesus leads, that's where I want to follow. Amen? And I don't care what the world is doing. Because the world can't save me. The world is not paying my bills. The world, you know. And people are so fickle anyway. That if you, if you want to show, listen, if you could go right now and get you a crowd and it don't have nothing to do with Jesus and don't have nothing to do with the word all you got to do is just go on the street corner and just look up I know I'm right about it because Forrest Gump went running one time folk was running all in the desert and when he stopped running they said why are we out here well, you out there because you was following him. <laughs> if you just look up, if folk will start, they, folk will stop their cars. <laughs> you can even slip out and folk will still be looking. They'll be asking each other, why are we looking up here? Well, you know, somebody started this and there's something up there. And that's how people start movements. They just look in one direction and folk just follow them blindly without any direction. But we need to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. Follow the Lord. 
because the Lord knows what's best for all of us. Stand to your feet. I'm going to ask Minister Jimmy to come give the invitation as I go and get ready for these baptisms. Amen. And if you want to get saved this morning, you know, and you need to go to the water, we got water back here. <laughs> Let us thank God for the, the word today. You know, one thing I even took for that message this morning is we can't allow this world to harden our hearts. <clears throat> I mean, this world can harden your heart before you even know it. You're, you're upset, you're, you're hurting. That's because we're not looking up. We're not looking up to Christ and and, and, and Christ doesn't want this. He wants us to look up to him and trust him. Do we trust him? Do you trust God? Do you believe in God? So do not allow this world to, um, to harden your heart where you, you can't see Christ in everything that's going on because he's in everything that's going on in our life. And so as we have, we have the doors open this morning, you may need, you may not have Christ in your life, but this is the time to, to accept Christ. Just like this morning, we're going to have a, a few baptisms. It's because they accepted Christ. They knew they needed Christ in their life. They knew they couldn't walk away from Christ. They knew they couldn't do without Christ. But Christ is in their life. And, 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 I, and, and let's keep them in prayer. Because the world is going to do everything they can do to distract them. Yes, there is. And you, everyone here, we may have already accepted Christ. But you may feel this is the place God is saying that this should be your church home. I truly believe everyone needs a church home. A church home that's teaching God's word, 